to get on, but I look forward to um, showing you everything that I can, uh, the, the tricks that I use, and um, the ways that I create my liner cuts. Um, incredibly, everything that you need to um, create a liner cut is um, on the table in front of me, although it might, you might, might not see it. Um, it's a very small amount of things that can create liner cuts. Um, if you want uh, to, if you have a question, um, please feel free to hold it and there will be a space at the end of um, the demonstration where my PR team and I will actually be able to answer your questions. Um, I started the liner cut process uh, when I was studying. Um, and immediately connected with it because of um, the way you can create beautiful forms of uh, black and white contrast. Um, and it's, it's a very malleable process, um, a, a great surface for me to work. And the great thing about liner cuts is that you can create a a centimeter by a one centimeter liner cut, or you can create uh, a couple of meters worth of liner cuts. And um, that's for me the beauty about the process is you can have um, massive scale or small scale. Um, with regards to starting with the liner cut, um, here in South Africa, we get this uh, brown liner cut. Um, there is another liner cut that can be purchased called Mali. Um, both liner cuts are um, quite accessible in the country and both have the um, ways uh, that have um, a great malleable surface in the sense that you can cut in any direction in a 360 degree surface and there'll be the same resistance throughout the liner cut. So that's why I love the liner cut process. With the brown liner cut, um, it has a hessian at the back um, and that is great because it actually uh, has quite a strong, um, uh, it, well it is quite strong, which is, which is great for, for very large liner cuts. Um, when a liner cut is purchased from the shop, be it Mali or um, this brown liner cut, what I would suggest that you do is you have uh, 1200 sandpaper and you just lightly burnish along the surface and what that is doing is that it's um, creating a very flat surface on the liner cut. It doesn't have to be very long. Uh, what has happened is that uh, this liner cut has um, got uh, resins and plastics that are compressed through rollers and through that compression, um, even, the, even though the rollers are smooth, um, it creates a little, a very fine, like sticky layer that is raised. And uh, when you print, you could um, have these little ridges that make printing complicated. So just by rubbing the surface with the sandpaper, it gets rid of that, it makes it nice and smooth. And um, as, as little, I mean, it's for a, for a liner cut this size, um, I would take about 30 to 45 seconds to um, sand it down. Uh, please understand that it's important to actually concentrate on your edges uh, because people tend to gather the, the, the sandpaper in the middle and it's actually your edges that need the, um, the most sanding. Um, once that's done, you obviously have the liner cut and then you cut it down to the size that you want. Um, I use an empty cutter and I'll just show you quickly how that is done. So obviously you've got your liner cut and you measure out with a ruler um, and cookies just to mark the surface. Make sure it's straight. And then what happens with the liner cut is you just Make sure your fingers are out the way and run your cutter along the surface. You do not have to put too much pressure. You don't want to cut through the whole surface just to run it along the, the top of the liner cut. Please make sure your blade is put back into the cutter and then it's a matter of bending. 
now that that has happened, you the, the liner cut follows the, the, the tear that you've carved. And then, there you go. That's how I um, cut my liner cuts. I um, purchase liner cuts by the meter. So obviously, if um, I'm going to be doing smaller uh, liner cuts, obviously I need to score and cut, and it's quite a simple process. Now that we've got the liner cuts to the right size, um, obviously what we, we do is we have a piece of paper. There are two ways of transferring the image onto the liner cut. The first way is um, drawing on a piece of paper so that if you're unsure of your skill or you want to use reference material, you draw an image up. And uh, what I've just done is I've uh, drawn the image um, onto the piece of paper. And that just shows me how big the matrix is. Um, we refer to liner cuts in the printmaking world as a matrix. This is, a, this is a, um, something that we print from. But a matrix can be any printmaking medium. It could be wood, etching, um, or um, any other medium that we print from. But obviously for this demonstration it's going to be liner cut. Um, once I've got the correct size of the liner cut, as I said, then I would um, draw the image up to the size that I want. And if I make alterations, I can erase. Obviously, always use a pencil. Um, this is an image that I've created. Um, understand, it's you don't need to um, look at the tones of the work. All you need to do is look at the, um, the line work. I, I only use line work with my images. And um, then what I do is when I want to put the image on my work, I use um, carbon paper. Now it is very important to understand there are two different types of carbon paper that you can get. Um, there's a carbon paper for typewriters. Whoever uses typewriters, um, I'm not sure who does, but there is still carbon paper for typewriters. And there's carbon paper for handwork. And it's important to understand that you need to get the carbon paper for handwork, and it does tell you. Um, it's, the, it's film carbon for handwriting. Um, also understand it's important um, to keep your carbon um, out of the sun. Carbon paper can um, go stale and obviously when it's dried out, um, you can't, um, it doesn't transfer the image. Um, so it's important that wherever you keep your carbon, that it's in an area that is, that is dark. Um, and then obviously what happens is that once you've um, created your image, what I do is I use uh, masking tape and all I do is I make sure that the masking tape is taped on two edges um, with the carbon paper obviously face down so the line work is like that with the carbon paper below it and then it's just a matter of um, drawing with a blunt pencil onto the surface of the paper. And obviously the great thing about tracing is you can um, see where you've um, gone with your liner, with your um, carbon paper. So you can see the lines that I've created. And um, once I've done that, then I can start working on the image. I'm not going to draw the whole image up. I'm going to take it off to just show you the process. So that's the process that happens. It's just a line that is needed onto the liner cut. All right. And uh, you spend your time putting that on to the liner cut. Now I have a work that I'm actually already in the process of creating, which I'll demonstrate to you. 
So if you look at this liner cut, um, it's of a dung beetle and a, a sphere. It's a concept that I've been creating for a number of years. Um, but the two most important things to look at is the thin and the thick lines. Uh, when you create a liner cut, it is important um, to create a different variation of mark. And um, the, in, order to, in order to create that, you have different thicknesses of uh, permanent marker. Um, I will show you the permanent markers quickly before I demonstrate uh, drawing on the liner cut. So the one is um, Faber-Castell Faber Lightfast um, Permanent. And the other one is just a permanent marker. Obviously, whenever you work on um, liner cuts, uh, because it's a plastic, you have to make sure that um, your cookies that you use, the markers that you use, are um, going to be permanent. Because um, if you, uh, you perspire, and when you work on a liner cut, because it's plastic, it's not, it's not going to absorb the perspiration, and it's actually um, going to um, blur your image. So it's important to look at that. So one thing that I want to show you with this work is that you can see um, I've traced the image, uh, drawn up the sphere, um, put it down on the, with the one method of um, uh, using the carbon paper. And the carbon paper is quite durable. It's not going to rub off anytime soon. Um, you can put pressure on your hands and your, your um, uh, fingers onto the liner cut and it will stay there. It's, as I say, it's quite resistant. Um, but then I actually drew the dung beetle on, um, onto the liner cut. And that's the other way that I create my work is I actually draw directly onto the liner cut. So if you feel confident enough you can actually um, just simply draw the perspective and the space and the object that you're wanting to use and to create on your liner cut. You can actually draw directly onto the liner cut. Um, I like that method because um, it's permanent, um, things change, you can alter things, and I like the way the image develops um, as I draw directly onto the liner cut. So, um, whenever I draw, um, I have reference material. Now, um, I will admit that this reference material is not mine. So what I do is I have multiple images of uh, dung beetles and create an image from multiple um, images. I always use reference. Um, reference is important to me because my work is so um, scientifically articulated where um, the object, I need to know if it curves around an, uh, a sphere, in this case, that the dung beetle's legs and the, the form of the beetle actually, the sh foreshortening and, and the perspective is accurate. So, um, as I draw, so I look at the reference and I create the image as I go. Um, but for me, reference is incredibly important. And when I draw, it's just a simple matter of um, crosshatch and lines. It's what we call visual grays, and I'll show you um, the results of that shortly. Visual grays is what we call a liner cut where um, lines very close together are still black lines with very uh, um, few light areas. So if you look at this area, there's quite a lot of black. And then there's little light areas. There are areas that will be carved away, but there's a lot of of black here. Anything that is brown on this work is going to be carved away. Anything that is black is going to stay. Um, this is what we call the relief process and the re relief process um, when you ink up stays on the surface of the liner cut. Whatever you've cut away, um, think of hills and valleys. Um, the valleys are the things that have been carved away. The hills, hills are the things uh, that have been that are left or are the uh, original liner cut. Um, and visual grays are areas like the leg here, where you have highlights. All the the, blue, the brown area is going to be carved away, but then in between there you've got these lines, and that's what we call visual grays, where it's still one color. It's black and white, but the further apart the black lines are, the lighter it looks, 
and the closer together the black lines are, like here, the, the denser it looks. So these large areas, I've worked with the thick cokey to create areas of interest in black areas. I understand liner cuts lend themselves to in, an incredible articulation of light and dark and different variations. So in order to create a very successful image, you need to have um, light and darks and uh, different textures. So the texture on the beetle and the texture on the sphere are going to be different. Um, so that's uh, putting the image onto the surface. You have, um, uh, you've got uh, uh, two different methods. The, the image on the um, on carbon paper and then drawing directly onto the liner cut. So let's talk quickly about tools. There are a couple of different tool, tools that you can um, get. Some tools have um, long handles, like this, and other tools, and, and each of these tools has their own tool at the end. You cannot take them out. They are fixed. It's what we call fixed tools. And then here we've got a tool that is rounder. If I can get it up. Yeah, there you go. But what happens is there are multiple tools that you can use and you put the tools in and then uh, carve with this uh, woodcut tool and if you want to change the tool so you do so and put another one in here. Either set of these tools is alright. The most important thing is to make sure that um, the tools are sharp. So when you hold tools, uh, I'm right handed, you're going to hold with your thumb and your index finger and carve it, uh, uh, allow the tool to go around your fingers. With the um, long ones it's the same thing and you just allow the back of the tool to come to the back of your hand. All right. um, there are different tools, um, this would be a small spoon gouge, I hope you can see. Um, this is a large spoon gouge the spoon gouges enter the liner cut round and they exit the liner cut also round. This is obviously a smaller version of this. Then what you have is the V-groove. And these three tools are the tools that you will use the most in your liner cuts. Then there's the angle edge, um, which is used to carve. Um, but these three tools are actually the tools that you, you'll use the most. And all wood cutting sets has these um, tools in them. So that's the first thing to look at for um, carving your linic, uh, carving with Lanica tools. So I have a liner cut that I'm in the process of carving. As you can see, um, I've got a series of works. Um, look very carefully as I discussed the texture of the flower, the texture on top of the flower, and the texture on the sunbird are all different. That's uh, subconsciously that what, what people like. They like to be attracted to different modes and, and, and ways of cutting and creating a liner cut. As you can see, I've got quite fine detail, and these lines are quite complex. Any image that I draw on my liner cut, everything that I see, I will be able to carve, and you can too. Most of the time I'm using the small spoon gouge as well as the V-groove because of the complexity of the image. Now, when you start carving, it's very, very important. There's only one rule in liner cutting, and that is whenever you carve, you cut away from your fingers. You never want to carve towards your hand or your fingers. Um, you always want to keep it away. These tools are so sharp, and I'll show you how to sharpen them. They are surgically sharp. Okay, if, if, and one way of seeing is that if you want to see how sharp a tool is, you can use your, your finger. And if it sticks, which this is, okay, it's not slipping. If it's slipping, it means it's blunt. If it goes on your finger and stays, you know that it's sharp. So all the woodcut tools that, you, that come out of a new set are going to be sharp. Understand and remember, we will always cut away. And look very carefully, the, I'm holding the, with my thumb and index finger and the back of my hand, I'm holding the woodcut tool and I have com complete control of the cut. My index finger on my left hand is even touching 
that blade so that I have complete control and that I, I don't slip. You don't want to slip in your liner cut. You want to have complete control. If you're going to be carving towards an object, um, or put it this way, you never want to carve towards an object just in case you slip, you don't want to go through the image that you've carved. Because understand, when you when you cut away something that you've drawn, it'll always be there. You can't get you can't put it back. Um, and that's one of the things I love about liner cuts is that um, you cut what you keep. So I'm going to try and show you uh, running my hand along these lines here. I'm using the V groove. I'm in complete control of the cut, cutting the tail and these fine lines that are created with the fine liner, the permanent marker. The reason I use the permanent marker, as I said, is so that I can run my hands and my fingers across the surface and it's not going to deteriorate the image. Okay. So, as I carve, so I cut and within the last 30 seconds that I've carved, I've carved that. It would take me about um, two and a half hours to carve this image. I um, have a set of 12 of these. I started three days ago and I've got uh, nine, uh, I've got only three left. Um, when I start carving, I always run around the image just to define it in the light, it was the liner cut. There are some liner cuts in America and um, the Mardi tile is white and it's quite difficult to see your cut, but luckily because this specific liner cut is brown, and um, please understand, I have all the um, materials available and if you would like to know the materials that I use, please use my bio, my link tree, connect with my mail list and um, just ask for that mail, uh, that list of materials and I'll be very happy to share them with you. Um, but uh, because this liner cut is darker, you don't actually need to darken um, this liner cut. Sometimes what people do is they put a blue or a, um, a red color on top of the liner cut to see how you're carving. But because the liner cut is so dark and when you carve it's lighter, you can see immediately how the liner cut looks and, and, and how it's progressing. Um, and obviously what you need to do is make sure that there's a dustbin below you and um, you just, you just want, don't want to have um, pieces of liner cut all over the place. You keep them in a pile and then every 20 minutes, half an hour, you throw them in the dustbin. Let me quickly show you how to sharpen woodcut tools. It's quite an important process. So, if I'm carving a liner cut and I'm using this, the V-groove or the spoon gouges, all I have is, remember I used that sandpaper, uh, the 1200 sandpaper, it's the same, same sandpaper that I used to sharpen my tools. I find there are two angles here. There's a flat angle and there's a bevel edge to this tool. Um, it's a very easy way of um, aligning the, the, liner uh, the, the woodcut tool onto the sandpaper. And I'll show you how to do it. So obviously you find the bevel and the flat area. And then it's a matter of just going up and down. Or figure of eights. As long as you do it on one side, you turn over, find the angle, and you do it figure of eights or up and down. Okay. With, a, with a V groove, it's a very simple process. And you can see even that um, has taken um, the sandpaper and uh, metal off this woodcut tool. So one must be very, very careful. So if this tool was blunt, which it isn't, but if it was blunt, I'd literally sand for 30 seconds, turn over, sand for 30 seconds, and then I test. Obviously, um, you can, I will test in the background and check to see, yep, and it's beautifully sharp, cuts easily, is not um, is going in easy and going out, exiting the liner cut easily. Um, what I didn't discuss is that the V groove goes into your um, liner cut with a V angle. You can turn it around and do all kinds of things. 
the more pressure, the thicker, the lighter the pressure, the thinner, and it exits um, with a V-groove. And then with the spoon gouges, it's um, thicker, and the spoons are, um, are rounded, as I said, on the edges. So if you want to see the, the demonstration there, those are the V-grooves and the um, small spoon gouge. When you sand with the spoon gouge, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to find the angle. Start on one side and just go, I go in round circles and slowly you have to move it along. Uh, just a word of caution, don't spend time too much in the middle. For, rather focus on the edges of your spoon gouge and then you slowly be uh, bevel back, come back to the edges again. And I'll just do that once more. Start on the one side, moving to the middle, less time in the middle, and more time on the edges. Okay. And then again you test to see, and I can feel that the tool is sharper. Um, another thing to look at is, uh, I know that you can, most of the people hold their woodcut tools underneath, but you can also hold your woodcut tool on the top, like a pin, and you can create stippling marks on your liner cut. Um, you can also do that with the V-groove as well. The V-groove is obviously just going to have far finer lines. When I uh, carve my woodcuts, um, I use this technique quite often. So you can see the stippling marks. Yeah. So. Once the image is carved, and let me try and show you a carved image. So this is one of the carved images. The, the background hasn't been cut away, but the image is complete. What I'll do is I'll get all the um, Sunbirds images to this level of completion. And then um, what happens is... Um, I look at them all together, I see the, all, of them, uh, all of them, and, and if I need to cut and alter, I look at, and look at it and do it, do it now. And then what I do is I carve the background away. When I carve the background, I use the large spoon gouge and I go away from the image. You never cut with the large spoon gouge towards the image. And what happens is that you will see, very, you will see that there's a ridge that's been created. Because this is a large surface area, you actually want to cut another cut below to reduce the picture pane even further. So let me show you again. That's one cut. That's one cut. That's one cut. And then I want to get rid of these ridges, so I go in again and re-carve to reduce the picture pane even further. So that, that's what it looks like. So, there are two different ways of printing. Now, I won't demonstrate printing, but I'll show you the process. Um, this liner cut is carved. Uh, you can see, it's a, I hope you can see that it's um, a, a crocodile. This, this has just been carved away, as I showed you now. It's completely flat. It doesn't pick, the, the roller does not pick any of these ridges up. So, it's a white background. Um, and this image happens to be behind me, if you can look. But um, there are two different methods of printing. One is um, with uh, mulberry paper. Um, this specific paper is actually called rice paper. You can get it in the country, and uh, it's a specific uh, name. I think it's 615H, but um, I have the materials available for you, and you can order them at the shops. Um, this isn't the size of the paper, it's, it's much larger, it's one, uh, it's one meter by uh, 550, um, that's the size it comes, this has just been spliced. Um, again, there are two sides and you can run your fingers across if you don't know. Um, this is the rough side, this is the smooth side and obviously what happens, um, this rice paper is for hand printing, if you don't have a printing press, um, you're able to ink up the surface um, with a roller. Um, even with this large liner cut, I still like to use a small roller. The small roller allows me to control the flow of ink on the surface of the liner cut. 
Um, if you have any larger, the liner cut, that, uh, sorry, the rotor that's any larger, you have the potential of going into the recesses here and that can pick up ink and make your print muddy. So with a small roller, it allows me to um, get into all the, uh, all the surface area with the liner cut. Um, once the ink is on the liner cut, then it's a matter of um, rolling the paper. Obviously, this paper is too small, but as you roll the, the, the paper down and then you burnish with a spoon. So that would be one method, and that, that method doesn't need an um, etching press. Um, but then there's another paper that you use, which is etching paper. This is Rosapina um, Fabriano, uh, 250 grams. And this would um, be put through an etching press. You can see the pros, the papers are completely different. This is an etching paper, it's a rag paper, filled with paper fiber. Um, and uh, is able to take the pressure of the press. This paper, obviously, being so thin, would never be able to go through the press. Um, it's just simply to be able to print um, with a spoon. So those are the different papers that you use to strike up your edition. Most of my prints, as you can see, are um, going to be with the Rosapina paper. Um, and uh, you can actually, if, if you were able to feel, you'll actually feel that there's an embossing on the um, paper. The reason why I love liner cuts is because of the stark quality that you can get with the beauty of the complete flat blacks and then the stark whites that you can create and then obviously the different line works, the different stipples and line works that you can get on the work and um, it's one of the reasons why I love the liner cut process and um, Within a relatively short space of time, I can um, create multiple images and ideas that I feel I need to express. So that is the process of liner cuts. Um, I understand also the ink that you use is going to be a light, fast, permanent ink, um, oil-based. Um, I unfortunately, well fortunately, but I only ever use oil-based inks um, in my work. Um, and they're specifically letterpress inks. So that is from carving to um, it's from carving to putting the, the liner cut in, pro in, in process. Um, thank you for coming to my demonstration. Um, the time has, has now come to questions and answers. Um, if you would like to uh, email Please feel free in my uh, link tree in, in Facebook or uh, on my Instagram uh, bio. Uh, click on um, the link tree and uh, I'll be able to give you more information about uh, upcoming courses, liner cuts um, and newsletters. So feel free to connect with me. And uh, thank you very much and, huh? <laughs> and have a good evening. Sorry, my PR team sending me. <laughs> That I must tell people that you must have a good evening. So, thank you very much for joining me, and I will see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>